Jeremy started us off earlier talking about how we all know the importance of, of our physical fitness or working out each day, and it just makes sense to us to make sure that we can uh, incorporate that into our lives. And so and then, as Greg shared the example of um, thinking about this um, as something that is dynamic or almost dance-like, um, that makes a lot of sense as I think about uh, how clinicians help patients with understanding physical training, PT, um, other training kind of mechanisms where the body is dynamic. We don't expect the body to do a particular movement perfectly each and every time. What we expect a healthy body to be able to do is to be dynamic and course correct each and every time. So I love Greg that you brought that up. And uh, I had a chuckle when Nick mentioned the multitasking, that being an area that uh, for patients with uh, challenges around cognitive functioning or dealing from brain injuries, um, this is certainly something that cultivating that awareness of where they are with being able to handle more than one kind of stimulus in the environment and how they react to it. So once again, another piece of this for, um, for patients with, with that challenge. So as we bring it back into a lifelong kind of lesson, I think it's fascinating here for this discussion. Um, Nick touched upon this in, at the tail end of his comments, but I'm curious if each of you could share um, maybe one or even two very specific or personal examples as you're comfortable with um, role modeling this or working with individuals you're working with or who work for you or who you work for who are not yet comfortable uh, with this kind of mindset and both how you try to role model it and also how you contend with that in your mindfulness for yourself to um, keep that positivity in the circumstances. I always think that person's your teacher. And you know, there, there isn't a moment you can't use as a practice moment. And uh, I talked to an old friend of mine who was probably one of the least spiritual people I know, a very successful person. And later in life, she had children and went to visit her at her apartment in San Francisco and I said, so how's it going, this whole motherhood thing? And she says, you know, I decided that my son, who at that time was two years old, was an enlightened Zen master and his every action was calculated to teach me something about myself. <laughs> and I thought, wow, where did that come from? Because you're the last person in the world I would ever expect to think like that. But it was a perfect example uh, or a framework thinking about how do you deal with that person that isn't kind of on board with your own program, right? <laughs> what are they there to teach you about you? And can you open to them and be generous to them and show kindness to them and step into the world, their world and understand what's going on in their mind? Because, you know, maybe you were also that one, that person too, once. And, and so I, I find that to be the perfect sort of practice, right? Um, but the challenges are there to help you hone your skill. And, um, so that, that would be my, my quick answer. But I, I can share with you, maybe, let me give you a personal example. So here's how I try to set myself up for success each day. And I, I don't exceed this every day, but here's what I try to do. It, it, we talk about the mindfulness-based meditation part, which is really just simply simple breathing and allowing your mind to stay centered on the breath and to follow the mind it starts to push away into other areas and pull it back into centering the breath. So every morning when I wake up, as opposed to the first thing that I, I typically done in the past for the last 40 and some years is look at emails, check my phone, do all the things that I felt were important to set me up for the day. Before I get out of bed, I do about a three minute mindfulness moment before I get out of bed, where it allows me to clear my head before I actually take the first step out of bed. But that sets the image of the rest of the day. So even when I try to repeat it, something like that. On the way into work, I actually take a look at trying to do get another mindfulness check in before I get out of the car to be able to set myself up for success. I also take a look at trying to establish the meetings so they're not 15 during the day. Where you have a structured setting where you at least allow yourself 15 minutes prior to the next meeting 
to take a moment of reflection to think about exactly what just took place, and more importantly, were, was I successful from a leadership perspective in presenting the ideas and the concept and supporting the theme that I need to take place. That typically is followed halfway through the day with another mindfulness check-in based on centering myself, what are the next series of meetings that are coming, and more importantly, what do I need to do as a central leader to be effective for those sessions. And then not thinking about the practical or technical side of what we can be doing from a leader perspective, how am I engaging and empowering my team that's in front of me, and more importantly, how do I walk out of that session feeling successful? The way I typically lead the day, to be honest with you, is I get in the car, and I just turn everything off. Turn off the phone, turn off the radio, and simply be in the car for about 10 minutes. It allows me to decompress at a very natural level before my mind starts to wander of maybe the 15 things that I can do as effectively as I could. That's how I start today. During the week, I take a look at the sessions that are in front of me, and from a leadership perspective, I spend more time on attention on what's important for that team to hear from me as a central leader, again, as opposed to some of the tactical or technical aspects of what we need to bear. So what I'm trying to do is to consciously maintain a presence where I'm always looking forward from a leadership perspective. I'm using the mindful-based techniques as a way to be able to serve myself and to ensure that I'm not distracted with the other 15 things that need to be happening during those occurrences. And again, some days I'm successful, there's some days that I fall back. But I always try to start the day and end the day with a way to both decompress and clear my mind and to be comfortable that I've given as much as I could give based on the leadership that I was really brought to, uh, I was asked to provide for the course of that day. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's kind of how I try to see my practice as, as it relates to what I profess to the organizations that I have a chance to coach and mentor. And then I obviously try to do that on a daily basis to ensure that it makes sense both for me as well as the individuals that I'm teaching. I wish I did all that. <laughs> um, I think I do a lot of those things, but I do them in a more compressed fashion and briefer spurts, just a quick reset. Um, I think part of the question was around how we teach this or try to role model it. Um, uh, I think of two settings. One is when I'm doing quality improvement work or trying to move a project forward, I'm working with a, a team or a project manager or someone who's failed to make this quality improvement thing happen. And we're not getting the progress we want. We're running into some barrier. And part of it there is just breaking things down and trying to get that person and myself to think about what are the critical pieces that should make this happen and what's missing and what are the objections from the standpoint of this you know obstructionist position and it's being it's being cognizant that any change is hard and that something that you're doing is likely impacting them and they're afraid of that change or they have to change their workflow or something else um, so a lot of it is just taking time to think and let them know that you've made mistakes in the past in management and that opening yourself up that, you know, maybe there's room for improvement in the way you're managing this. Um, and maybe it's not just those guys, you know, maybe we're not doing enough to make it easy for them to get where they need to go. On the teaching side um, of my life as a clinician educator, I think a lot about the junior lear learners who come in thinking they have to be perfect and they work so hard. And they, um, study, okay, maybe not as much as I do when I was their age, but, um, <laughs> you know, they, they take it seriously and they want to be perfect, and they are in a culture which historically has not been kind to people forget things. So the expectations are high. And I think the great opportunities that arise there are when we as a team miss something. We miss a diagnosis. We missed, we made a mistake at a drug. We had a patient that was mad at us or a family that was upset. Those are great opportunities to stop and get people to be mindful about what we as a team did or what someone as an individual did, what the pitfalls are in thinking, um, in diagnostic decision making, in counseling, um, in all those things that make up medicine. And, and let people know that it's okay to make mistakes, everybody makes them, and give them that 
um, role modeling that you have made such a mistake before and you've tried to learn from it. And, and you know, it's not perfect, it's not a destination, it's sort of a journey. Thank you. It, 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 sparks, it, it sparks another opportunity, and I think, and I thank you for bringing it up. Because it, mindfulness based practice is, is yet an integration of other opportunities and tools that you have. So if you take a look at change, for me, change has intersectionality, and there's three types of change that we deal with on a day to day basis. There's, there's change that's brought down from above to you, there's change that you, as, as a leader, uh, direct, and then there's change that that direction is, you know, is given to others. And at any one point in time, for any meeting you may have, you may deal, be dealing with the behaviors and relationships in, as it relates to the intersectionality of all three changes. What mindfulness has done for me so has allowed me to be slow and deliberate to understand each one of these meeting sessions, especially as it relates to change processes that are in place based on the urgency of medical aggression, etc. On what are the human behaviors that are important to allow this change to be adopted and accepted? And what's the likelihood of success? So the technique of bringing yourself back to understand those specific attributes of change are important. And mindfulness allows you to somewhat self-center yourself, to realize that those truly are the vital opportunities that allow sustainability of your programs to actually progress. So I guess I, what is bringing to mind is that, that, that mindfulness is not in itself the answer. It's just an opportunity to combine other aspects of what you bring as a leader to the table and allow yourself to be very clear and focused on what it takes to actually push your programs through you know, from that perspective. So uh, I'm glad you brought up the idea of change and change leadership because, again, mindfulness-based practices for me allows me to understand how best to navigate some of that based on a particular circumstance or situation that individuals that you're asking to change or to take this initiative forward may have to play, play in and out. Yeah, and building on that, I'd like to say that mindfulness does nothing but make it possible everything. There you go. Right. I couldn't have said that. The, um, somebody taught me a question a couple of weeks ago that I found to be incredibly powerful, which is to pose to the people you're working with what business or organizational problems could be solved or better approached if there was increased understanding and connection in the situation. Right. So let's take the word mindfulness out of the equation and talk about how do you increase understanding and connection. Because I think all the things we've talked about are methods for there's part of you, there's a problem, and there's part of you that wants to go on the attack. And how do you corral the part of you that wants to go on the attack and, and instead inject more understanding and connection into the situation? So I started this whole work from Drucker's point of view of knowledge worker productivity. How do, you use, how do you help people who use their minds to make a living, which is all of us, how do you help people who use their minds to make a living be more productive? And one of the core insights was that productivity in, in, in the world of knowledge work isn't just about quantity, right? It isn't just stamping out parts. It's also about quality. And one of the things that I've discovered d delightfully in, in getting to work with clients and, and students is that the quality of conversation or the quality of trust or the quality of connection they have in a non-linear fashion enhances their capacity to be productive. Because now I'm willing to talk to her in a way that I wasn't. I was willing to share information with him in a way that I wasn't before. And because the information because the, the relationships themselves are stronger, then the information flow is easier and of higher quality. And that's something you can't capture on a, on a balance sheet. But it is absolutely the heart of what makes organizations function. Because right? I might have a quality issue, and I'm too terrified to tell him hey, that there's a problem, because he might want me to attack, and I might get hurt. But if I trust him, and I know that he has my best intentions at heart, then it's a lot easier for me to come forward and say, look, we've got to talk. Right? So, yeah. I, I had to learn as a clinician educator early on that I scared the shit out of people. <laughs> Tall, I have a deep voice, I was in a position of authority, and I would 
make a critique about the way someone did something on rounds, which is what you're supposed to do as a teacher, and they would burst into tears. <laughs> I was like, I, I did not handle that well. I must not be giving the right message. So um, I, I think that helps you be mindful when you realize the power you've got over each other in these interactions and how people might take what you're doing the wrong way. Um, I know in, uh, as a, in that role as well, and in my current role, you often end up as a mentor or someone who's trying to give people career counseling advice. And part of that is trying to get them to understand what they enjoy doing and what they don't enjoy doing, where they thrive and where they don't thrive. So, for example, if you're if you're in meetings all day and you feel the energy being sapped out of you, meeting after meeting, you're probably an introvert, even if you don't <laughs> act like an introvert. You need time and space, um, and you know just that's kind of self awareness. That's being mindful of what's giving you energy and what's not. And you can adapt your work to fit that awareness of, and that mindfulness of what gives you energy and what saps your energy. Let me see if I can serve a good example of that. So uh, uh, we, we always like to take a step back and say, based on the, the span of control that you have within your organization, what can you do tomorrow that will affect change? So when we have a chance to work with, with, with leaders in, in organizations, and you've, you've heard different terms used probably for the same thing, but, but establishing principles of commitment on how your senior team will interact, communicate, and allow yourself to potentially have the time afforded to do the things that we're talking about is probably step one. Uh, and I would encourage you to think about, about doing that. One of the avenues that, that typically you see from some of those principles of commitment is not only transparency and how to communicate effectively together as team leaders, but it's also to allow yourself some time to have that protection around what's important for you to be re-energized in the course of the day. So I'll give you a simple example that, that, that I'm sure many of you already have in this room, and it's something that many in your span of control to do tomorrow is to allow yourself some protected time during the course of the day. Then the meetings will be scheduled. I know that seems a little bit embarrassing when you have 14 meetings a day. But at some point in time, you have to take a position where I need to take care of myself to be an effective leader. The status quo of having 20 meetings a day that you're double booked with 250 emails that you feel compelled to respond to is not sustainable as an individual and is not sustainable as a professional. And if you think that you're going to mature your professional career based on that, I'd ask you to rethink that. So what you can do tomorrow, and which is probably in your control and at some level, is to say, I'm not going to have 12 meetings today. What is truly relevant? What do we need to accomplish this week? And what initiatives do I need to be participating in to move forward? In some leadership teams, what that means is they'll give themselves, whether they call it sacred time or protected time, to be able to do the things that are important for them during the course of the day that allow that decompression to happen. And maybe you do your mindful minute for three minutes in that protected time. I'm encouraging you all to have uh, the time and, and, and attention to be able to try to make that transition for yourselves tomorrow. I know it's not easy uh, because the traditional workflow and the stressors are not going to go away. But I can tell you honestly that to have a sustainable and effective program if we don't take the time to do what would be considered the small things in life, the end result is going to be very difficult for you to sustain. Uh, well, it's hit me where another individual that's done a lot of really great work, uh, it's called, uh, her book, her latest book is Micro Resiliency, uh, which is really a form of, uh, of mindfulness-based programs. It's Bonnie St. John. You may want to take a look at the, uh, her most recent readings. But it's really taking a look at what are the small micro steps that you can do on a daily basis that over time will yield great results for yourself. So again, taking a step back, and what can I change today that will affect greater returns for me and the team tomorrow? That's a list that you need to be thinking about. But her book on micro resiliency has about five dimensions that she takes you through which a part of those dimensions is mindful practices, and there's other techniques that she's encouraging you to think about. That would be another opportunity for those that are thinking about it and have a look at other techniques that embody those mindful practices and give you a collective gain as related to who you are as a senior leader. 
Thank you for sharing with us. I know we started out earlier talking about how we recognize what we each individually react to and why we're reacting that way. And then we also moved into beginning to develop that understanding of how others are reacting to us and that we're just as much a piece of this whole interaction. Um, we talked about the chaos that comes with change and thinking about the constant reacting that we're having not only to each other, but to that thing out there that we've got to change um, with or along, along to. Um, and we've talked about the sustainability of a mindful leader for ourselves. What do you guys see as some best practices or um, things to consider for the sustainability of mindful leadership at an organizational level? I'll start off. Have a creative community within the organization and have, have uh, spaces and times for that community to be. That, that will be, I think, the, the driver in sustaining it and then eventually shifting culture. So I think also having top leadership involved uh, is helpful. I don't think it's necessarily uh, needed, but it is, if it's there, it's extraordinarily helpful. Uh, I, I think all the things that we've talked about, right? look at what you're already doing. Who's in the meeting? Why are we having a meeting? What is the result of, supposed to be of this meeting? How do we need to prepare for the meeting, right? Or do we just mindlessly have a meeting because every, every Monday morning at 11 o'clock we have this meeting? What are you already doing that you can inject under greater understanding and connection and intention into? The idea of, you know, I don't know about you, but my calendar program schedules things at 30 or 60, 30 or 60 minute intervals, right? Why? Who said it had to be an hour? Right? Why can't it be 45 minutes and then you've got 15 minutes to go smoke a cigarette, check your email, go to the bathroom, and maybe think about just what just happened, right? Why does it have to be that way? Uh, have, if you're having a one-on-one -on -one encounter, ask the other person to leave their device at their desk and you're going to leave your device at your desk. What happens if you have a staff meeting where no one, leave, no one brings their device to the meeting and you actually have a meeting? And if people feel that's a waste of time, then why are you having to meet? Yeah, it's, it's, I was privileged last week to sit in on a, uh, an executive session with the senior leaders, and that's exactly what they did. Uh, they formed some, what they would call principles commitment design, but a meeting uh, schedule was one of those. Um, and for the meetings they could control, you can't control the hospital meetings that are coming toward you. We have three, three levels of, of change. They made that conscious decision to, to establish 45 meeting sites. That's it, no hour session, they're all 45 minutes, minutes, and that allows for 15 minutes of decompression as well as preparation. And when, and, and when I refer to preparation, we're talking about the mindset change of preparation. So as we work through a fairly significant wall of post-it pads on what would be important from that team's perspective on committing to principles that they could actually manage chores, that would surface as one of the highlights for them. Because when you took a look at their schedules, you know, they typically they had 9 to 10 to 11 meetings. They had to make some decision on power of delegation, power of authority, and more importantly, the sequencing of where they should be at any given moment. And what they realized is that they were becoming non-productive because of the back-to-back -back meetings. And one way to circumvent that was that no meeting would be scheduled for more than 45 minutes. Which, you know, is, is not an easy practice to begin, but within the area they could control, they felt comfortable with that. And what will end up happening is, is, is that as they feel much more empowered to be more productive in those sessions, I think it will emulate across the organization, potentially adapt some of the principles that they're bringing to bear. So at some level, or it's a tough question to answer because it's really now being built into the fabric of many of the operations we see in a hospital-based setting. Uh, but it's not that it's a prevalent course of action today. As you heard, we, we have various aspects of what we do from a mindfulness approach and what we do every day, how the organizations collect themselves around a common community, and I love, I love that phrase, exactly right, that allows uh, the organization to, be, to have that mindset is still growing. 
I mean, uh, so to be quite honest with you, I mean, when we have a chance to work with teams, we work at the local level to allow them to be comfortable and successful with the approach. And then typically what you see happens is it emulates across the organization because they see the value of what we're doing. From a culture perspective, it's not it's it's a very tough road to go if it's an air war where it's dropped down. And that's why I use the term it's really groundwork, a groundwork. It takes a tremendous amount of individuals collected around the community to emulate those behaviors and be consistent with those behaviors before adoption and sustainability comes into play. So again, it's not the it's not it's not the answer. It's an answer that you can use to get where you want to be. Uh, but it takes an organizational positioning of courage to allow it to happen and a tolerance to be compliant to that. And that's what you have to work with every day. And it's tough. I, I don't think at UC Davis we have yet bound this up in a cohesive program. I think instead we've got pieces of it here and there. And so in terms of how we're going to hardwire it, um, I think we've got our work cut out for us. I think you've got to schedule it. You've got to schedule time for it and build it into certain practices. Um, a lot of places have a, a time for reflection at the beginning of the meeting or at the end of the meeting, a reminder of what their mission is, sometimes a patient-centered story. I think that's a, a good practice. Certainly, there's lots of times in, in the critical clinical areas where we stop and we are scheduling pauses, but we don't do that same thing in the boardroom so much. Um, so I think it's a good idea to do the same thing you do when you sit down and look at your daily list of what you need to accomplish. You usually write out the big important things for your long-term goals that are often harder to accomplish, and then you write your list of more urgent or sometimes time-limited things that may not be important, and you're trying to balance those things. Now, if you're only, a, if you're only accomplishing those short-term checklist things, you're not succeeding. So you've got to be mindful of that stop and reflect on that and the, the same thing that applies to me as an individual applies to the organization. If you see you're not getting the big ticket things, you've got to stop doing the disaster of the day and schedule time to work on the big picture things that you know you want to accomplish. Let me underscore that. I had a client that's uh, an aerospace company, 60,000 people around the world. And, and like Nick said, the ground war is, is the most important because that's where the work actually happens, right? And so the team I work with, their intention was at the end of the day, we have accomplished important things, right? We can walk out of here knowing we've accomplished important things. That was the, the intention that the team came up with. And then they backtracked into that saying, okay, if that's our intention, what do we have to do to fulfill that? And one of the things, indeed, that they come up, came up with was something they called project focus time. And every day, people got, if they needed it, 90 minutes to not be bothered. Now, if the burning was building down, or the client showed up, then you, know, you could interrupt them. But otherwise, they got dedicated time to focus. Because if they didn't have that, they wouldn't, you know, the alarm bells would go off and they would get distracted by other stuff. So, it's now been three years, and that, pro and that process has served them well. Uh, I think you can ask yourself also the question, what is hindering or helping my quality of attention? And when, you know, when we talk about mindfulness, fundamentally we're talking about the quality of attention. And so I, I suggest people do what I call an attention audit, which is to look at what in your workspace is there to hinder or, or enhance your quality of attention. And the same team, the leader of the team realized that her desk face the entrance way to their department. And every time somebody came into the building, she said, you know, she was kind of socially compelled to say hi to them, right? And she said, I felt like the highest paid Walmart reader on earth. <laughs> and that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm constantly interrupting to be polite because it's a polite, friendly culture. And, and she said, and so she, what should she do? She realized she should take her desk, turn it 40, 90 degrees so it faces the wall rather than the, than the hall. And she said, wow, I can concentrate and, know, and I don't have to feel guilty. Right? So that's one thing she did. The second thing was to notice what on her screen was distracting her. Right? 
And the, the, she didn't need to know all this stuff that popped up every one, every, you know, randomly to break your flow of attention. I mean, research done 10 years ago showing a three second interruption in your flow of attention triples the number of mistakes, doubles and triples the numbers of mistakes you'll subsequently make. And it takes about 20 minutes to regain that quality of focus. And I think the same, I think this may be wrong, but the same research found that it, that you were interrupted like 50, every 15 minutes. So like mathematically it worked out that you could never ever really focus, right? So which is at least how I read that paper. I may completely misinterpreted it. But, um, but anyway, you know, thinking about what is there to help or hinder your quality of attention. And, and noticing, and then there's screen practice. You know, where do you notice your attention? Lifting off this important thing you have to do to go you know, look at kitty cat videos. And then you realize, oh, I'm, I'm stuck on kitty cat videos for, for 20 minutes or an hour. And then, and then, you know, I have to go back here. Right? Just watching when that wandering mind starts to wander somewhere else. Uh, and then to build off of the, the point of 45 minute meeting, your attention span only has about like 60 to 90 minutes worth of charge before it's depleted. And so, you know, in organizations like this particular company where the meetings are six hours long with no break, you know, the last four and a half hour of just, you know, <laughs> contributing carbon dioxide to everybody, you know? So, there's simple things you can do. And, uh, and, and they add up over time. So, I, so I, it, it sparks another memory here. Uh, the, the whole team, including the panelists, a grand challenge for tomorrow. Right? So I want you to visualize a, a cloud and, uh, and all the things that you have in that cloud as it relates to your working activities. And ask yourself, how many times tomorrow do you take the course of the day in, that, that you're mindful versus that your mind's filled? Right? So how do, you, how do you distinguish that? It's the difference between autopilot and pilot. That's another way, in my, in my mind, I frame it. So an autopilot for me is when I'm coursing through the day and my mind is wandering and I'm being distracted on the 10 things that are either ahead of me or behind me. So for me, that I just flip into autopilot mode. I need to check my email, I need to check my voicemail, I need to check my meeting schedule. I'm flipping into kind of an autopilot phase as opposed to having time and attention to what I should be focusing on, which is the difference between is my mind filled or am I mindful of what I'm doing? So the grand challenge would be, and the Lord's going to tell me, the email for tomorrow, during the course of your day tomorrow, just make a note, how many times was my mind filled with stuff? Did I just flip on out of pocket? Was it 10 times? 10, 12 times? Or was it two times? Based on really being mindful of, of the meeting settings that you're in, that's just an easy indicator to turn, you know, I, for me personally, I'm at a scale here because I'm on autopilot 50 times a day, and I probably should be much more on pilot mode 12 times a day. So, I, I, I can't remember who asked the question, what can I do tomorrow, but that may be something you can think about. So, just kind of repositioning yourself as it relates to, do I, should I take the next step into a mindfulness-based program? Just count the number of times that your mind is still tomorrow, versus the time that your mind is really present in the moment you're the meeting, and then take a look what that difference is. And if it's a huge difference, I can tell you personally, my mind is way out of scale. It probably was an indicator that I need to take a moment to reflect really how productive can I be as it relates to being a conscious leader. So there's a grand challenge right there. Or we'll email you tomorrow all the numbers. We'll see where we stand. Yeah, that also means you're getting an email from me tomorrow, too. So. <laughs> Um, I want to talk about the industry that we all work in. We work in healthcare. And we've talked about many, many examples that are specific to um, the kind of industry and kind of work environment that we're in. But if each of you could share a little bit about um, how you see mindful leadership in particular, um, especially helpful for those of us working in healthcare. Um, or maybe it's the other way around. What is it about our industry um, that can help pave the way for more of us fully embracing this kind of leadership. I think there's all kinds of levels in this. From the, the personal level we've been talking about probably the most is how you manage yourself. Then there's the idea of how you help others or make others to do this. And then there's a level 
on a leadership level where you're trying to foster mindfulness throughout the organization. And last but not least, there's been a lot of studies that show if you can improve mindfulness in the patient, that you can do a lot of good things. Mindfulness about when they hurt, about, um, about a lot of different things, about when they're feeling good and bad, about their activity, about what they're eating, etc. So um, uh, it's a long list, I suppose. Um, I'm not sure exactly where to start on that question, but I, I, I just want to point out there's a broad spectrum in healthcare. Yeah, it's, it's a moment for pause, you know, right? Here's a, really, it's, it's a good question, it's a tough question to answer. I mean, you know, from a personal perspective, I think what it has, will it allow individuals, just certainly based on my experience, is to have much deeper meaning on who you are and, and what you can give back. And for me, being in healthcare, it was, it was, it's always been and will always be about contributing back, which is the reason I'm in, in, in this, this industry. Mindfulness, I think, allows me to personally just kind of grips with, with how best I kind of manage myself through that process. However, at least the organization, I think, has had many benefits because ultimately it provides greater healthcare, more appropriate care to the patients in the community, and, and that's important to that. Uh, a greater support bar for the community of support for that patient, be it their families or the direct care of them. So I think it, uh, I think it does establish a healthier community at large. Um, but it certainly is a discipline that requires effort at first uh, and patience. And I guess the test of time will is still out there whether it will be truly embraced and ingrained into an operational. Uh, component of where organizations are going, and uh, I think the work is still something. Yeah, I shared with the group earlier that uh, a friend of mine who's a chaplain for a hospital in Oslo, Norway, was staying with us when I was talking about this panel. I said, so, you know, what do you think? He said, that's great. Because look, we have to walk with patients as they go through some of the most pivotal and oftentimes painful and profound moments of their lives, and yet, we, almost, we do very little for ourselves in that process. Um, and how do we withstand all the stuff that comes with us? I, I had a, a student, former student of mine talking in class this week, he was, a, he was a, a vet of the Iraq War, and now has dedicated his life to helping vets heal from uh, PTSD. And he said, you know, I, uh, I witnessed so many things. A lot of things happen to me, but I witness a lot of things happening to me. And we don't realize the traumatizing events of just witnessing stuff. And you know, in, in, the, in the medical setting, you're seeing all kinds of things happen, and yet what do you do to help regulate yourself and repair yourself from being exposed to a lot of pain and suffering? Like why that isn't built into the daily life of your world? I don't know, because it because it's something that's there day in and day out. Right? And so it's really about, to me, the long-term sustainability of the profession, which is happening, interestingly, in every profession. Uh, in law, too, there's a question about, is this sustainable? How, do we, how are we you know, behaving and, and living in this world? It's not sustainable. We have the highest rates of of uh, social and, and personal dysfunction of all professions, closely followed by medicine, closely followed by teaching, like the 50% uh, dropout rate in teachers <laughs> right, within five years. And as a country, yeah. we're not great at this, you know, compared to a lot of other countries where they're taught to take more time, take time for themselves, et cetera. So we may not be the worst, but we're not first at this. <laughs> Yeah, we aren't good at it. And the same friend in Oslo, I asked him about his day. He said, you know, I usually go home at 3.30. And uh, I said, so what happens when you're busy? He goes, yeah, sometimes we're busy. He's like, well, what time do you go home? Four. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but that's not us, you know. So, you know, what do you do to build into your daily life some, not just repair and renewal for the sake of your own health, but also for the sake of your own effectiveness? 
think it's always important in this day and age where things go faster and faster and more is asked of all of us to think about how we take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. Um, everyone knows about the stress of, of being a caregiver and most everyone in this room probably knows that when um, there's someone who's ill, you ultimately look to see who's the caregiver and is the caregiver really okay because many times they're ultimately suffering just as much, just in different ways. But all of us, by working in healthcare, are caring for the caregiving industry. So perhaps we need to think about it that way and realize we all deserve this ability to be able to preserve ourselves in order to keep going with what we want to do. We have about 10 minutes or maybe a couple minutes less by now um, for the panel, and I want to make sure we get some time for questions. So I'm going to turn it over to all of you for any outstanding questions you may have for anyone on the panel or for everyone. And just a friendly reminder, this session is being recorded, so if you can wait for the microphone after you raise your hand if you have any questions. Starting with, did we answer the questions you asked at the beginning? Much more anxious and tense, 
that's the time where you can start to take some very deep breaths and, and self-center yourself and that will get you to respond differently. Uh, don't, I don't think you need to feel compelled to have to react within a given time frame. In fact, sometimes it's much more effective if you actually have that moment of reflection before you, before you respond to the situation. But the mindfulness part of it would be for you to understand as your body starts to fill up as it relates to that anxiety, at that moment you're starting to slow yourself down. And taking a couple of deep breaths is certainly appropriate. It's going to allow yourself to say, wait, I'm recognizing that this confrontation is not easy, uh, that I'm going to have to potentially think differently in how to respond, but you're going to feel that earlier than later if you start to practice that mindfulness based behavior. And that's going to allow you to take a moment back and start to decompress yourself. And if, you know, if, if that's the beauty of mindfulness from my perspective. It doesn't have to be a 15 minute or a half uh, or a 30 minute predecessor to anything. It happens naturally. And the more you get comfortable with that, and the more you understand how your body's reacting to a situation, be it pain, be it anxiety, uh, be it uh, feeling depressed, you're able to be concentrate on what's that driving force, allow yourself to have some moments of, of reflection through breathing, and then you're able to respond. So I would, what I would suggest is don't feel compelled to have to react at, the, at that time. You have the right to be able to take a step back and pause and reflect. I don't know if that's helpful, but I think what the mindfulness practice will certainly has allowed me to do is to recognize those triggers earlier than later and allow myself and have the confidence to, to relax to a point where I can appropriately respond. To give yourself a time out, say I'll get back to you. But it, sometimes in healthcare we don't have this luxury, however. You're, you're, you're dealing in situations where you're not just talking to somebody about some administrative decision. You're worried that somebody's going to get hurt. So there's there are structured tools around that, like cuss is one of them. If you've heard that, I'm concerned. I want to understand why you're thinking this way. And the last thing you said, you followed the S word, the safety word. I'm concerned this is a safety issue. We need to stop. You know. So there's no one answer to what you're saying. I don't think, but I certainly taking a deep breath, being aware of it early giving yourself permission to take a time out or say, I'll get back to you after confirming with others on this matter. Things like that help a lot. And then there are some structured tools when there's a safety issue at all. Yeah, what they said. <laughs> Sometimes I use it as an opportunity to ask questions. Yeah. So instead of focusing on what I have building up in my mind that I want to say, and it's usually upsetting to me, before I start formulating those sentences, I just use the time to get that 10 seconds or what have you by asking them more questions. And sometimes I learn something else I didn't expect. Or sometimes I learn I've got to get my nerve up and figure out how I'm going to say this in an appropriate way that's productive. Well, you will always lapse. Uh, so don't don't to feel like you know. I tell my students, look, if you can do this uh, one time out of ten, you're doing good. 
right? So don't, don't bring any uh, ambitious perfectionism to this particular task, right? Uh, the other is to say, hey, let's, look, I just messed up there, let's rewind and start over again. You know? And hit the reset switch and let's try this again. That's simple. But the, I think the overriding concern is don't try to be perfect. Because <laughs> if not, you're going to get stressed out just trying to be perfect, right? That was one of the first things we learned in, in almost day one of the classes, is that it's not a perfect science, right? Because we're human, we're wired differently. We move, we move in and out of this process. And so, and, and that's hopefully, I, hopefully I said it a few times, it's probably like it's good for me to keep hearing it for myself. But I'm not successful every day. And I, and I know I'm not going to be. But I am conscious on, on, on when I could have been better, and I try to obviously recover from that. But it, you're right, if, it's, if you expect to be perfect at this, it's, it's going to be difficult. That, that's the best, most healthy first step, is recognizing something went wrong and thinking about what could I do to make it better, what were the things that made it go wrong, how can I change my own behavior and try to influence other people. If you don't ever go through that step, you'll never really hit the other steps. So that's that self-reflection, maybe a little too late. Um, but, you know, make it proactive next time. It's always a long journey. Well, I want to take a moment to say thank you to Nick and to Greg and to Jeremy for joining this panel today. And on behalf of all of us, I want to extend a thank you to Eric and Ryan for helping with the logistics of bringing us together today. I hope that all of you have enjoyed this as much as we've enjoyed being able to share this and, and talk with all of you. So thank you. Thank you.